Good morning. It's just after five o'clock here in central Alberta, and we're on our way to go meet Blake Hall. He's got four beef booked for the day. It's gonna be a good day. It's gonna be a hot one. That's why we're starting early. All right, so we just pulled up to the farm here. We got Blake. He's just getting set up. It's just after six. We're gonna get her done before the heat of the day. It's gonna be 30 degrees. Don't want the beef getting sour. And Blake's gonna give you a little tour. How's it going, Blake? Good. Yes. All right. Uh, morning. Uh, yeah, I'm Blake Hall. I work for GNS Meats in Morningside, and I run the slaughter rig. So, it's a pretty sophisticated design. I can't take credit for it. Uh, it was a there was a unit that was, came before this that was designed by Gene Chambers, who worked in the industry for a long time. And basically, he designed it to function like the lines in the packing plant. So everything is done off the hook, all the legging and skinning. There's no groundwork. And so, guys who skin in the cradle, it's, a, I would say, a bit faster. But this is easy on the body, it's easy on the back, everything's done ergonomically. So it's a really good design that way, designed with longevity in mind. So uh, Valentine Eaton bought GNS Meats from Gene Chambers 13 years ago and then has refined his design and then built this trailer uh, four years ago. So a bigger crane, more water. So yeah, basically we can walk around it quick. Um, I work off of this side, so the beef you'll see is come, yeah, is laid here, and I work off the hook here. Uh, I've got my pressure washer, my hand washing sink, I have an air knife, my uh, saw, and what's nice about this, this is the 5500. It's a big enough crane to pull the hide, so we pull the hide off everything. Any carcass that weighs less than a thousand pounds we have no problem pulling the hide off uh, if it's over a thousand pounds like a big breeding bull I just kind of need to assist with my knife but it can still pull the hide off uh, and it's tall enough I just realized I parked under a power line so we're gonna have to move but uh, um, so I know like there's many ways to skin a beef uh, there's many ways to butcher a beef and so, like, I, I don't think that this way is better than any other, but for sure having the beef off the ground helps keep it clean. And we kind of live in a forgiving part of the world. I know a lot of American butchers and the Kiwi butchers I watch, they work off an enclosed trailer with a, re with a rail system, and it's chilled. Uh, so we have this stainless steel box. We, I guess what I'm saying is we can kind of leverage our cooler climate for most of the year. Um, so we... I you'll see I shroud the beef in a body bag and then I lay them in this box um, and we can haul up to four beef at a time. Generally our rule of thumb is the clock starts as soon as the first beef hits the ground we have five hours to get it back into the cooler. Depends a bit on the weather. Uh, that's why we're out here so early this morning because we need to get them into the cooler before the heat of the day. The beef we're doing today aren't going to be huge. They'll be about 600 pounds on the rail and uh, we shouldn't have any problems with getting it chilled adequately. Okay, we'll see you with the beef on the hook. What do you shoot them with? Oh, yeah, I shoot them with the 223 full metal jacket. Uh, so yeah, high power 22, excellent penetration with that slug and a very accurate rifle. I sight it into 100 yards. Very seldom am I taking a shot even close to that. Uh, I would say the longest would be about 50 yards. Most farmers will get the beef contained in some kind of pen or enclosure, um, shoot them, bleed them, and then we bring them back to the rig with the farmer's loader. And then I'm independent from that point on. Any other questions? Yeah, you're right. Okay, so I mean, I feel like that's what that's the service we offer, not just butchering, but we offer a stress free, humane slaughter on the farm. So, yeah, if you get a nervous animal or an injured animal or, or any animal, there's no stress of handling it, it dies where it lived. Yeah, and I, I feel like there's meaning there for the farmer, especially, you know. Uh, 
farmers grow produce and then harvest their crop. And so there is something meaningful for, in this case, a beef producer to harvest the fruits of their labor on the farm and feed their family or community with it. In Alberta, we're lucky that meat can be sold off the farm this way. It can be sold uh, in quarters, halves or holes, to families uh, uninspected off the farm. So there's a certain responsibility there because obviously we fall outside the realm of third party inspection. Um, so food safety starts with production. Uh, if that's a healthy animal grown in a good way on the farm, then it should yield healthy meat. And I'm always mindful of it as I'm butchering. I'm not trained as a meat inspector, obviously, but there's certain things that are obvious uh, if an animal's unhealthy. And if, if something pops up, I'll bring it to the farmer's attention and we can take pictures and send them to the vet um, to get an idea of if, but, but if it's safe to eat, but we almost never encounter that. If an animal's not safe to eat, you can usually tell on the hoof uh, if that's the case. But yeah, I don't know. I think we're nested in a bigger context. Like this is kind of <laughs> keeps that government inspection out of the system. And it's just the private realm between the farmer and uh, his community. And uh, we're here to facilitate that in a good way, uh, in a clean way, in a swift way, and especially a way that's humane to the animal. I don't rush my shot. If it takes 15 minutes to get a shot off, if the animal's nervous, that doesn't bother me. Um, and it, I'm not perfect. Uh, I do miss occasionally, maybe one in 200 shots. It won't drop the first time uh, if it moves its head or something. Um, but I, I still think the aggregate is that this is more humane than rough handling or, or you know any kind of handling in a bumpy road between here and the butcher shop and perhaps personnel at the butcher shop that are better trained in meat cutting than animal handling. I don't know. Anyway, there's a good argument to be made for on-farm slaughter is what I'm trying to say. Anything else? Okay. All right, Blake's still lining up his shot here on the first two. Bah. Two shots, two down. So Blake successfully dropped the two beef there. Right now he is sticking or exanguating the beef. So that's taking all the blood out. Important step in the process, otherwise you can wind up with blood clots in the meat, uh, in your steaks and roasts and whatnot, which kind of leaves an irony taste. Important to do it uh, real quick. Because then uh, there's no oxygenated blood going to the brain of the beef, and they are officially dead at that point. It goes up into the artery. See, so make note he uses his leg to brace the beef's leg, so he's not going to get the knife kicked into his other sticking hand there, I think, is the, the yeah. technique. Don't stand here ever. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I guess I kind of expose the neck that way. If the head isn't up like that, if it's down here, which sometimes happen, you might have noticed on that beef, I pulled the head back just to stretch the neck out. And then I make the long incision. That's basically the first cut I make to open, start opening the hide. So I've already made my first step in the process. Okay, Mark is going to come with the tractor. We're going to hook the beef up, take him over to the trailer, and uh, get opening them up. 
So I guess this process is dependent on the, the farmer having a tractor there for you. Mark's got a tractor, he's going to be with us this morning and then he's got some work to do and he's going to head out. But and you'll see the rest of the blood come out of the animal. That's good for the quality of the meat. Mark will drop it off with Blake there and then we'll uh, go hang out with Blake and he's going to give us a step by step at each part of the process, the multiple processes in skinning a beef. Like he said, quality starts at the beginning so he's going to be taking care of hygiene as he goes. He's going to give you some tips on how to leg, how to gut, all those things. So we'll uh, hop in with Blake for each step. Obviously the main uh, source of contamination on this carcass is going to be if the outside of the hide touches the meat and so that's kind of I'm always mindful of that while I'm opening the hide and skinning that I'm peeling the hide back onto itself <laughs> safety step number one if they're really dirty I'll, I'll wash them down with my pressure washer before I've made an, any opening So this part, uh, this process now, you're starting, Blake, is called legging the beef? Just about, yeah, I'm going to open the hide all the way. So I connect, I open the tail and I connect my incision with that incision I made on the neck. That's the reason I made such a long neck. Now from tip to tail, the hide's open. Now I'll leg the beef. And so, yeah, yeah. I don't have a he, the farmer's going to bring me a bucket and I'll throw all the waste in as I go. I'll do it very clumsily. So right there, you got to be careful cuz that's the Achilles tendon and Blake later on in the process is going to that's where we're going to hang the beef from on the rail when it gets back to the uh, butcher shop bit of a tricky, probably the most knife intensive part of uh, this whole operation is what you're doing right now, hey Blake, opening the leg? Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. So I just take that strip off, because it opens it up without having my other hand right in there, it's a little safer. I learned that trick on YouTube. <laughs> so what you're saying is if you like and subscribe to this video you'll get better at killing beef? Maybe, yeah. That's right. So I At some point we have to switch so it's hanging from this leg. So I've got a hole under the Achilles and I've got a hole through the Achilles. And you'll see why I have two. Shortly. One pitfall, one pitfall of doing the beef this way, like if they're on the ground, you can break the back feet off, but you don't have leverage when they're hanging like this, so I have to saw the back feet. And so I've cut, I've made a little cut there where I want to saw the foot off. Here comes Mark with beef number two.
So yeah, as you can see, I'm just using gravity to my advantage, opening the hide up and rolling it back on itself. So of course, there's a little bit of contamination around the hawk. I'll probably get crucified for doing this, but... <laughs> Do you want to show the guys what knife you're using, Blake? Uh, They're always curious. Uh, Victorinox straight blade six inch boning knife. Victorinox beef skinner. And for sticking, I use a uh, Victorinox eight inch straight blade boning knife. So when this wears out, it becomes my boning knife and I get a new one. <laughs> Jarvis air knife. If, if you aren't familiar with an air knife, I'm not sure if you can see, it's got two blades that run against other like a pair of scissors it's a pneumatic tool for skinning and what's nice about it you know it well it's, it skins all the way around so you can take a nice wide swipe obviously not as wide as this but I can skin both ways up and down maybe another necessity of doing a beef on the hook like this is you basically have to learn to skin with both hands because to skin this left or what would that be the right flank with my right hand this way basically impossible whereas on the ground in a cradle you can skin the whole beef with one hand if that makes sense so you can see that air knife just goes through like butter. We used to use those in the plants and it's two sets of teeth that are going back and forth on each other, kind of like two sets of reciprocating saws and uh, it really, really gives your hands a break if you're doing this all day long. So the technique is you kind of go down, in and up, down, in and up and wherever there's tension that's where you kind of start to pick away uh, at the tension. So the beef hide, like Blake said earlier, begins to fall away from the carcass. Mark's leaving us a tractor bucket for guts and hide and hooves and hair. You want to give YouTube a wave, Mark? <laughs> I just skin over the asshole and vulva on this heifer. Instead of skinning around it, you can just cut right through it and leave that on the high. That's a major source of contamination and that was a real breakthrough learning to just skin it that way. So when I'm opening the hide, I just go on the right hand side of the asshole. So right there, Blake's skinning over the top sirloin, and that's kind of like one of the biggest pinch points. You can see on the outside of the beef, it's kind of, the hide comes to a, a point there, and it's always a pinch point, it seemed like, when we were working on the line. That's the most difficult part to skin with your air knife without getting into the fat and affecting that nice fat cover. I use this hook. I grab inside the bung, I bung the bottom part of that animal so I am exposing the joint on the oxtail I want to break. Then I can just go in and break that tail off. Oxtail soup.
this is what adds this is what adds time to this system changing the hooks around Nice clean job, that hide fell away. There's no outside contamination on there. Just nice, pure white fat. If the animal's really dirty, uh, been sitting in mud or manure all winter, all Opening the hide that way over the foot really dulls a knife, just going through all the dirt. So I'll often just carry a spare boning knife just to do that. It's already dull and then I'm not wrecking my knives for the day. So on a warm summer day, Blake, we're doing four today and then you're calling her quits. Uh, what's the difference between summertime and fall and winter? Like how many are you killing on a, a perfect day that's, you know, three degrees Celsius? Uh, which is what is that in Fahrenheit? 34. Uh, I mean, my average would be five or six. It depends how much driving I have to do, how many beef are in each farm. Like today, I can set up on one farm and get four done. If I couldn't do that, we wouldn't do four today. It's going to be too hot by the time we're done. But yeah, a nice, cool spring day six is no problem go get three go unload at the shop and head out for a couple more seven is fairly common uh but i've done nine in a day that's kind of the the top end it, it's just the logistics of transport eventually I mean, you can see it's the same joint I'm hitting that you would if you were just breaking the foot off. Nice big knife strokes. And he's got his hand making sure that that hide stays off of your nice clean meat. Basically, I just want to expose this flank until I can start seeing the rose meat there, and then I'm good. This meat here, this meat here is the rose meat, and it's aka the butcher's pride, is also known as that, yeah. That's an extra couple pounds that a good skinner leaves on for you. So despite all my uh, distracting Blake, he's guys basically got kind of the back quarter of the beef opened up here in about, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. So makes good time. Let's get in a little closer to see how that air knife works. So there's so much less tension on your hand using that. They're really, really nice skinning tools. Gets up to the pinch point, releases the tension. There's that, he's working around that top sirloin, kind of the pinch point of skinning, the most difficult part to skin. But now it's just about prep for a hide pull.
Blake's just cleaning up uh, the bung there on the other side. Now you cut the udder off in the midline where you got to open up the beef. That's kind of always your source of contamination. Coming down to expose the H bone and into the guts. Now th we'll be doing the eviscerating right away here. Oh, and you break the H-bone with a knife, Blake. Well done, man. Uh, these young heifers you can, usually. The older animals, it gets too hard and you have to saw it, but it saves the step. For those of you that don't work on or have never worked on a slaughter floor, that was a bit of skillmanship right there. I don't even do that. So we're going to do the gutting now, important step, it's not too hard but uh, if done wrong you can obviously wind up with guts all over your nice clean carcass that Blake went to a good effort to keep clean so. Here's a little piece of cartilage right at the, I guess that'd be the bottom of the brisket. So you, I just very carefully slice that and then I can, it's easy to get my saw in there. Right so just below that's all brisket bone. Yeah. And you don't really got to worry about below that. Opening up that breast bone, that brisket bone makes it nice and easy when you do cut the rest of that little membrane that's right there. The guts will just fall out right down below to where Blake, the hide is still on. And if you do by chance, you know, nick a gut on the bone or something like that, it's not going to spill. Whew, just <laughs> shook off the trailer. We're going to eviscerate it into the tractor barrel, cut the last set stomach membrane, there's the stomach, Blake's pulling out the bung, along with a little bit of excess kidney fat. Okay, so it's a process you kind of, kind of do with a bit of, you know, you got to do it rather quick because if you wait too long things kind of get hung up and they'll start to stretch and, and rip, but uh, yeah, you can bust the gut if you let it hang there too long. Yeah. So I just sliced off the gallbladder as I was eviscerating it, and then we saved the spleen. Job well done. No spilled guts. So Blake, to, uh, in some of those steps, we would have known if this was kind of an unhealthy animal, right? That maybe the liver would have been full of pus or inflamed, or there's uh, the kidneys right there. They all they look nice and healthy, right? Like that's when you're looking for the health exactly. of an animal. Yeah, as we're eviscerating it, I'm I'm appraising all that stuff. I mean, we whether we know it or not, we're appraising that animal on the hoof. If it looks healthy, the farmer might have a concern. Uh, and now we're confirming that everything's good to go. So I start with the kidneys. Then I pull the kidney fat out. If you want to make, if you want to be a shady butcher and make money, you can leave the uh, kidney fat in and bill the customer for that extra weight. But that would be dishonest. <laughs> I hope the mic caught that. I said if you want to be a shady butcher, you can leave that kidney weight in and bill the customer for it, but they take it out. Good guys, good guys. I mean, that's a, that's a perfectly healthy liver. So are these kidneys, those are beautiful. And if the liver wasn't healthy, it might have large abscesses on it, discoloration, or a bunch of kind of blood clotty veins going through it, but just kind of that opaque purple color is what you're looking for. So then the, if you have a lousy liver, the question becomes, is that a localized infection or a systemic infection? Usually a few abscesses I'm not too worried about. That liver would be condemned in a plant, but the carcass wouldn't be. But I'll look when we get to the throat to see if there's any infection in the lymph nodes there or any other red flags.
there's our heart. The ticker come out of there. Like you can see here, this little bit where the lungs are attached to the rib cage, that's a sign that at some point in this animal's life it had a pneumonia. Just a little bit of scarring left in the lungs, not uncommon. Particularly in our cold weather, right? Yeah. Another little nice touch that Blake does is he leaves on in there. I uh, maybe can't see it now, but there's that bit of flesh right there. That's the hanging tender. Other guys will drop that out with the lungs. So it's another couple pounds for your ground beef. And actually, it's a good steak. So on the line, Blake said this trailer was kind of designed to simulate the, the packing plant line. What Blake would be doing right now on the line is called fronting. So you f do the front half of the beef, drop the hide off of it. Typically in the plant though, uh, all the skinning is done first and then they drop the stomach. So it's just done a little bit different here today. Process is a little bit smoother for Blake or whatever the case may be. What do you guys do with the lungs, Blake? Dog food? Dog food. Dog food. Windpipes are worth 20 bucks right now. Seriously? Yeah. Do they dry and smoke them for dog chews? Or? I don't know what he does with them. I think he just uh, sells them frozen like that, cleans them up, and, but yeah, they're, they're dog treats. That's pretty cool to have the beef that high, you know, that's really ergonomical. In the plant, well the plant I used to work in anyways, you had to be bent down. Uh, to get that neck and the, the brisket of the beef. So it's, it's, you might not appreciate it, but that's pretty nice to have it uh, right at shoulder height to work on there. So to me, the front legs are the trickiest thing to skin. I don't know if it was the same for you, but uh, to skin and keep it clean. So anyway. <laughs> that used to be my job at the Lacombe plant. I was the fronter. You were? Yeah. Oh, okay. So for me, a breakthrough, because I could go in and do that with my right hand, was learning to do this with my left hand. When I, because I go in with my right hand and I'd rub my forearm all over this meat and get it dirty, and this way I'm not touching the meat at all. And 
and then I keep it in my left hand and I kind of do the opposite here. And I basically just go through until I can see light there where I skinned along the neck. So then I got a little opening and then I just connect the dots. Then I wash the bone dust from my brisket cut at this point while it's at working height and I just wash the dirt off these bottom bones. There. Blake just nailed that quick, no problem at all. But there's one joint that's flat, another joint is rounded. And uh, if you're doing that at home, that flat joint right there, there's no big bump. That's the right one. The other one's called the farmer's joint. I don't know if that's the technical name. They wouldn't teach you that at vet school, but that's what it's called on the, on the kill floor. All right, exciting part coming up, the hide pole. So as I'm pulling, what I'm looking for, like here, it's wanting to tear this meat off. So I just want to make sure that I'm cutting any of that that appears. Watch that power line. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> That's pretty cool. We never used the hide puller where I used to work, so that's nice. I should have backed up to give you guys to show you the full reach of this unit here. That's a very nice trailer that they have. Okay, so we missed Blake breaking the uh, Atlas joint, which he did real quick and smoothly, but... What I... What I'm aiming at when I'm shooting the beef is actually the back of the head. I want to hit that brain stem. And I found the bullet here. Um, Just hold one second. We'll put that. There you go. Look at that. That's cool. Uh, and this Atlas joint is totally broken. So that I'm very happy with my shot that means it was a perfect shot that animal was dead on impact so when we went up and did the the sticking he would have been rendered totally senseless oh. there would have been no Before sensation hit the ground yeah that's absolute perfection in a shot so tripe is worth eight dollars a pound right now for dog owners and so I will now save the tripe. Eight bucks a pound? Um, and I do it now just because I'm, this is as dirty as I get. I'm about to do a big wash. I'm about to handle the hide. So I'll get the tripe, throw the hide in the bucket, and then do a big wash down. As opposed to saving the, as opposed to saving the tripe as soon as I gutted the animal. So a tripe is one of the stomachs, right? It's the lining of the rumen. Basically, is what I'm taking. Um, so there's kind of this. Well, whatever. I don't know how much detail you want me to go into <laughs> on tripe saving. I don't think anyone's. Not too many people are going to save tripe, but we'll stick it in there just to gross everyone out. Yeah. Basically, I just separate the rumen from the rest of the gut. And 
And then I got to pull this call fat off. And then open it up. Whoever's still watching at this point, you get a thumbs up from me. Good job for not chick <laughs> chicken and out. So, <laughs> I told Valentine I'd do this for him until I got E. coli. <laughs> Say that again. I told Valentine, my boss, I'd do this until I got E. coli. <laughs> <laughs> Little fun fact, all beef have, is this, this is correct, isn't it? All beef have E. coli, it's just a matter of making sure it doesn't make it onto the meat. Yeah, it's what strain? Yeah, that's right. So there's multiple strains of E. coli, and it's E. coli 0.157. 0.157H7. 0157H7 is the E. coli that is pathogenic to us, but inside those ruminants there, Blake just... Oh, if you could smell it, that Blake just opened up, there would be E. coli in there. Yeah. Maybe potentially not lethal to us, though. A high grain ration turns the rumen acidic, and so that strain lives in an acidic environment. And so, normally our stomach acid kills E. coli if we consume it, but because that strain has evolved to tolerate an acidic environment, it can get through our stomach into our small intestine, and that's how we get sick. Eat grass-fed beef. <laughs> I mean, this animal hasn't been pushed very hard at all. I I no concern at all. So, I mean, the reason I open the hide so much when I bleed the animal is it saves a step right now. I've already opened the hide all the way to the chin. Makes it easy to pull the tongue. And I mean, I mentioned before, I would be looking, if sometimes if an animal's sick, there will be a little pus pocket in here for some uh, lymph nodes that are infected. In the plants as well, you have to, uh, one person's job is to present the head for inspection. So Blake dropped that tongue out. Often they'll be hung up by the jaw and uh, the tongue will be dropped and some meat at the back of the throat is dropped as well to expose two glands that health inspectors come have a look at and they can determine whether the animal is healthy, uh, ready for human consumption. Another thing they do in the plants that uh, we don't have to worry about to doing today is they will inspect the teeth. The teeth will determine the age of the beef. I can't remember exactly if it's at two permanent incisor teeth make it yeah, it's something like that. Two, it's either two or four permanent incisors on the bottom jaw make it over 30 months old. And then if we were in a big plant, it would be treated different because the spinal column would then be considered OTM and potentially contaminated with white cell prions, a.k.a. Uh, what gives a beef BSE or mad cow disease. What's that opening for, Blake? Just to make it a little easier when you split the, the meat of the neck? Yeah, there's heavy connective tissue in there and it's just going to fly through the neck now. Blake uses a reciprocating saw in the big plants. They use uh, band saws on counterbalances. Let's get in there and see how he does. This is a, what is it, a 444 well saw by Jarvis. It's technically a breaking saw, but a splitting saw on this rig is completely impractical. Um, so it's a bit of a trick to learn to split perfectly with this saw. So I just split basically just past the corner here. Once it pops open, then I flip it around and I'm gonna follow the spinal process all the way down to get an even split.
Oh, in here is always the trickiest. It's the most amount of bone mass and muscle mass, but Blake's doing a really good job. You can see that he's got those feather bones on that side, and he's doing it with a, with a well saw. Quite a tricky job. Nice balance on the spreader bar. It's not dipping to one side or the other, so that means a nice even split. So Blake's just going to do some cleanup now at this point, I think, hey, eh? take the heart fat out and the midline and spinal cord. Yeah, and then I clean up this little bit of trim along the midline where my arms were working. Uh, yeah, one thing I do when it's hot in the summertime, if this carcass is going to spoil anywhere, it's going to be along the bone in the hip. So I'm going to make an incision exposing the uh, hip bone and it'll draw cool air into the hip faster. And so I basically... From our H bone, I go up about an inch, straight in till I hit that hip bone. And I expose it from the front. I don't know if you can see that, Duncan, but there's yeah. there's the round hip bone. And yep. So as soon as this gets in the cooler, it's gonna help chill that bone. This carcass is probably small enough, but on a big animal, 800 pounds, it makes a big difference. So quick pull, that spinal cord is out of there. Just cleaning up that heart fat and a little bit of blood clot from the stick. The midline, there's no meat there mostly, cartilage. And he just opens up that hip socket, let that air out. Now Blake's just knocking that bone dust off of there just to make it look a little nicer, cleaner and you don't want that grit on uh, on your meat obviously. So um, I don't know what you said about the split. I'm reasonably happy. It's not a perfect split but it's it's good enough. As you know this is the most valuable meat on the whole animal. And so if the feather bones end up on one side and you expose all the meat on the other, we dry age everything, we're going to lose, you know, 1% per day of that very valuable meat. And so it's important to get an even split. Even though it's not perfect, we do have bone covering up that valuable meat all the way up and down, um, which obviously gives value to the customer. When we started, I mentioned the first line of food safety being production. The second line of food safety is what I did, kind of being mindful of cleanliness and then technique to keep, present the carcass as cleanly as possible to the shop. And then the third line will be the, the people working at the table. They're going to keep an eye. If I missed any contamination or anything, it'll get trimmed off as they go, guaranteeing a healthy, safe steak for whoever's getting this beef. It's actually a very impressive split with a, uh, a well saw. Most most plants are using a counterbalanced bandsaw, so well done. All right, now Blake's got each side tagged. Uh, I guess if you're doing multiple farms, if you're doing a couple stops or a couple different people's beef at one farm, he tags them so he knows whose is who when they get back to the plant to unload. And Blake is just going to put that shroud on now, and I believe, I actually I don't think they get quartered, so. Inside of those shroud bags are obviously clean, so Blake puts that on so when he's going down the road, even though that their little box compartment is tarped, you're not going to have any dust on that nice clean carcass he put all that effort into.
There they go. One done, three to go. Okay, there's our last two beef. Uh, I got Blake shooting them the first go around here, but I'm not sure how YouTube likes that sort of stuff, so I might uh, might not get this shot on there this time, but I'll let you know if it's a good one. First one, sh drop, first shot. Blake's just taking his time, letting her get still. This part of the process is just about having a little bit of patience. So you get a good ethical shot off. Second animal. Second animal, no problem. Two perfect ethical shots. Stress free. Stress free as it can be, I suppose. All right, this one we're just gonna let the camera roll for on Blake there, uninterrupted. Time him. See how fast he can do it. Here we go. Alright, Blake's putting the last critter away, and uh, nice looking critter, definitely better looking than the crickets that they're trying to feed us now, so thanks for watching. <laughs>